All right. Appreciate the song this morning. And um, it's a blessing to be in church. I did want to make a quick announcement here for you that are watching here. There's your Doritos. Um, but I did want to make an announcement regarding uh, just what we're trying to do as far as uh, just trying to play things safe and things like that. We suggest for people that are older to maybe stay out for a little while, not because we're trying to push them away, but nobody really knows what this stuff is. You say, well, I've got my opinion. Everybody's got an opinion just like everybody has two armpits. And, you know, we don't know what's, we don't really know what's going on yet. So we go based on what little bit of information we have and who knows? I mean, you never know what things you go through your whole life and you're completely ignorant of. You know, we may not, not, not know some of the things we've dealt with in life until we get home to heaven. So we just go on the information we have and we try to encourage people to play it safe. Uh, we're certainly not telling anyone to stay away. I mean, if they want to come to church, I might well tell them they can't come to church, but we're just trying to make the suggestions as the authorities are making suggestions about what people should and should not do. So having said that, we'll keep trying to follow the, uh, some of the guidelines that the state's following. And as we're able to open up more and more, we'll do so. And hopefully we'll get to where we can, you know, pack it out again. Will everything be back to normal again? I don't know if what, what's going to happen. It's too early to say what. And so we just have to go from there. But let's take our Bibles, hopefully, and get some help this morning from the Scriptures. 1 Timothy chapter 4. If you'd like to stand with us, we'll look in two passages here. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and 2 Timothy chapter 3. I better take these Doritos down or people are going to be salivating the whole time. So uh, I'll keep these here. If I get hungry during the message, I may be snacking. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter number 4 and 2 Timothy 3. 1 Timothy 4, 2 Timothy Chapter number 3. Having said all that, you know, don't look down on somebody if they're wearing a mask or they're not wearing a mask or they're staying home or coming to church. I mean, to his own master, he stands or falls. You know, people get real opinionated on stuff and, you know, okay. are you a scientist? Are you, a, I mean, prove, prove whatever you're trying to tell me. So it's really just so much up in the air. So let's just have Christian charity, try to do the best we can. And, uh, you know, we'll get through this and hopefully we'll be able to fill up the church again. 1 Timothy chapter number 4 and 2 Timothy chapter number 3. 1 Timothy chapter number 4, verse number 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. Now come over to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. So you'll notice in 1 Timothy 4 he mentions the latter times. And here in 2 Timothy chapter number 3 he mentions the last days. 2 Timothy 3, 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away." I want to preach a little bit about the Christian and prophecy this morning. We're going to go to several texts and hopefully this message will give us some encouragement and some help in the times in which we're living in. Brother Joe, will you pray for us, please? Lord, well, thank you for the opportunity just to be in your house this morning and just to be able to fellowship with, uh, with our brothers and sisters. 
and just thankful. Uh, we're thankful, Lord, that, uh, that we're able to sit under a preacher that preaches the truth and delivers it straight uh, in the way we need it. And we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much. You know, uh, I don't know about you, but I've gotten a little freaked out here in the past few weeks. Things are just weird. Uh, we're in the grocery store, and somebody was telling me about it last week. We're in the grocery store, and they got this thing that says one way. I'm thinking, what in the world is this? And everybody's walking around with all these masks on, and I try to wear one if I'm in a grocery store and things like that. And I'm walking through here, you're seeing people with masks on. It says one way, let's be responsible. Then they come over the intercom. We are all in this together. Stay in your lane. You are being herded. You know, and they didn't say that. I, I kind of, but I'm just kind of getting weirded out. I'm thinking, man, this is kind of this worse, worse than being in the airport, you know. You go to the airport, just if you, those of you that travel a little bit, you know, some things are a little more different in the airport. And, and even for years, I mean, you go to a football game or something, you're not taking your knife in there. You sure ain't bringing a firearm in there. And there's a lot of things through the years that things have changed. And now we're seeing some really weird changes. You're walking in stores. You don't even realize they're pointing something at you and they're taking your temperature. Your temperature is a certain thing. They're going to tell you you can't come in. Now, that's weird. And we're living in some weird times where things socially are changing. And uh, this is strange. And I think a lot of people at this point, not just believers, but people out in the world that know the Bible has got some type of mystery to it and the Bible has some type of authority to it, people, they have their ears picked, perked up a little bit. They're like, what does the Bible say about this? Even Christians are a little bit interested in prophecy. And, you know, was the Bible saying anything about... Some of these things happening in the future and, and everybody's got these ideas and preachers are preaching on all these kind of things. So I want to put my two cents in if I can this morning. Not in an opinionated way because I want to stay in the Bible. Because people, especially in Bible believing circles, unfortunately, a lot of our preaching is very opinionated. And oftentimes the authoritative preaching that comes from the Bible that should be authoritative, oftentimes that same channel by which we're authoritative with something that is absolute truth, we're authoritative with opinions. So you want to be real careful. And, uh, and I want to be real careful that I'm not just up here being authoritative about my opinion. I'm ride, riding a hobby horse like so many of us do. We're all guilty of it. Everybody, like I said earlier, has opinions. But I hopefully want to give you something regarding Bible prophecy that might help us as we deal with, here's this great word, change. Don't you love change? I will say this, and I've preached this before, spiritual growth is about change. In your body, every so many years, your cells change and they die off and rejuvenate, however that works biologically. But growth is change. I was thinking about when we come together and when some of the little kids start coming back, we're going to start noticing, you grew two inches. <laughs> Hadn't seen you in how long and now you're this high? And sometimes you'll notice kids when they're about 11, 12, 13, all of a sudden they start taking this growing spurt and they come in, you know, and their pants are like this because they've grown three inches. And, and you're like, man, and, and, and that's change. And all of a sudden the boy's voice will drop down and go up here. <laughs> Growth is about change. But boy, we don't like change when it affects a lot of times our society. So let's look at some things. And I want to kind of use an illustration, if I can, to help us clarify our Christian response. I know you have your American response. And we're not talking about being an American here. I'm preaching to Christians. And I know we're in America. But if, if what we preach from the Bible can't work all the way across the globe, it's no good. But how do we respond as Christians? That's what I want to deal with here. And I want to use the illustration like we're, we're traveling. And we're traveling on a road and we're in a vehicle and we have a beginning and we have an ending. So let's talk first of all about the road that we are on. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. We're moving forward in time whether we realize it or not. And I remember back... Uh, it's been several years ago now, 2001, 
whenever 911 happened and now the world got turned upside down and we're thinking I can't believe this is happening and everything's freaking out and we're starting to lose liberties and all this, that and the other. I remember where we lived in Georgia was real close to the Air Force Base, Robbins Air Force Base, which is the largest employer in the state of Georgia. That's how big of a base it is. And at the time, the F-15 was the fighter pilot, and that was the main place for the F-15s. And I'm out in the yard one morning early, and all of a sudden, man, there was about 20 of those things, back to back to back, that took off. This is right after 9-1-1. I'm thinking, what is going on? Chills, start, you know, my hair stands up on the back of my neck, you know, and you're thinking, man, this thing could get serious. And when things happen like that, you begin to think... You know, my whole world could change here. Now, where are we? We're in 2020, for crying out loud. I thought the rapture would happen before this. I remember being in Bible school thinking, okay, 1992, this is it, man. The Lord is coming back. <laughs> oh, well. 93 is when we really thought, because they're like, okay, if you got a seven-year tribulation, okay. <laughs> 93, you know, 2000, that'd be the millennium, right? Well, he didn't come back. Well, 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, this is the point I want to make about the road we're on. The road has a beginning spot, and it has an ending. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, come down if you will. For the sake of another point in the message, let's start in verse number 20. I want to give you the context. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. We'll come back to that in a later point. Verse 23, but every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming coming, then cometh the end. So you notice there's the first and then there's the end. So we have a beginning and when we think about where we are on this road, Jesus Christ died on the cross 2,000 plus years ago. He was buried. He rose again from the dead. And there's a resurrection that took place then and it says Christ the first fruits then he goes on. Here we are 2,000 years later. That's where we are on this road. We are not first century Christians or second century or third century. We are at a long distance from that. And this road is going to run out. Well, I just don't like change. The road's going to run out. I'm sorry to say some of you, these young kids, they might not grow up like we grew up. They might not have the dreams fulfilled in their mind like they think. I'm not trying to be mean or spoil your, your here, happy forever after. I'm just trying to preach to you and tell you, you need to realize some of these things. Life is changing. And where are we on this road? I believe, I gave you two verses from Paul's epistles because that's where we are to look for, for prophecy. And he mentions the last times about seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And he mentions about people departing from the faith. We can see that all over the place. And then when he went through that whole plethora of things over there in 2 Timothy chapter 3, man, disobedient to parents, perilous times, all those things in that passage... Where are we on the road? We're a long ways down the road. You say, well, preacher, this thing could go over another 150, 200 years. <laughs> Even if it went another 100 years, what's 100 years? We're already 2,000 years past the resurrection of Christ. I believe we are a long way down the road. 1776 is a few years ago when America was founded. This is still a very young nation, but we're a long way down the road. A road has a beginning. Obviously, it has some stops. It has some roadblocks. It has some detours. You think about our country. Our country became a superpower, at least by the time you get into World War II, really World War I. But those two wars changed the world. If you know anything about history, World War II changed America. You say, well, they're keeping up with everything. Hitler put a mark on people without computers back in 1940-something or 30-something. And by that mark, he put people in camps. We'll talk about a mark in a minute. 
The road has a beginning and it has an end. We have to realize that as believers. The hard, science, hard sciences, by that I mean, you know, real physics and real math and real chemistry, not this philosophical science, which is theory. Now theory has become science. And theory is really not the hard sciences. The hard sciences tell us the sun's going to burn up. They tell us the magnetic field and the stuff around the earth is going to wear out because the laws of thermodynamics teach us that there's entropy in a closed system. Things break down and fall to pieces. You can't just keep going on like this forever. And when you th take that and apply it socially... You can't ride the wave socially that America has been riding forever. And the church can't ride the wave as far as prosperity goes, as far as freedom goes, like we have enjoyed for the past hundred years forever. Change is coming. Revelation chapter number 10. Be turning to Daniel chapter number 12. In Revelation chapter number 10, the Bible tells us there's an angel there that stands on the one foot on the sand and one on the sea, and he declares, he holds up his arm to heaven, and he declares that there should be time no longer. Daniel chapter number 12. Things are going to be wrapped up here after a while. And I think we just go on and we think, well, everything's just got to be like it is. No, everything doesn't have to be like it is. As a matter of fact, things are going to change. So I don't like it. I don't either. I like routine. Or maybe it's a routine. <laughs> I like to get in my ruts. Drink my coffee, read my Bible, eat my cereal, take my vitamins, different things. Daniel chapter number 12, change. Boy, we don't like that. You say, Preacher, are you running for office? No. <laughs> Daniel chapter number 12. Look down in verse number... Well, verse number 1, we have the time of great tribulation mentioned. But come down to verse number 4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Keep that in your mind. We'll come back to that later. Turn over to Matthew chapter 13. What is the road that we're on? I'll tell you the road we're on. We're in what the Bible describes in the book of Revelation 1, 2, and 3, the seven periods of church history. We're in the last period, I believe. And we don't have to go through a study of that. I have a whole series. You can go to Sermon Audio where I preached on each church. And I gave you the, par uh, the whole uh, panoramic view of church history as you break down in, in church history each of those church ages. And when you get to the Philadelphia age, you have the time of the awakenings and the time of the revivals. And then that thing tapers off. And when you look at it and you put it and try to mirror it up to real history, put it in real time, you have around 1900, you get around 1920 with the fundamentalist movement, then that thing tapers off. The last little surge of any type of big revival was the early Billy Graham crusades in the early days of Billy Graham. And then that thing as well died off. And so, where are we at? Well, when you look at Revelation 1, 2, and 3, we're in the last period, which is the Laodicean church age. That's where we are. That's the road we're on. We're toward the end of the road. So to try to make it something that it's not is to live in a fairy tale world. To try to make America the America of the 1960s or 70s or 50s or 20s, or whatever your ideal of the great America that you have come up with in your own mind was, you know... Pre-Civil War, whatever. Colonial days. <laughs> we have to realize as Christians, we're headed for another home. Amen. And I know for young people this is hard to get your mind around. I know when you have more in front of you than behind you, time appears differently. Some of you older folks, you've got more behind you than in front of you. Not being mean, but you've, you're, you're, most of your life's behind you. And so it's easy to say, hey, I'm ready for heaven. But you have somebody, their whole life's in front of them. Man, they've got all these things planned out. They've got college. They've got career. They've got Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright. They've got all their children and grandchildren and all these plans. We might be in bread lines in three or four weeks. 
I'm, just, I'm not trying to be Mr. Doom and Gloom, but the grocery store shelves could be empty in a matter of a couple of weeks. Things change. Look at Matthew chapter 13. Look at this thing. Bear with me. The road that we're on. Come down to verse number 40. Notice Jesus Christ mentions something here as He gives the parable of the tares and wheat and so forth. Notice in verse number 40. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. Look again in verse number 49. And shall cast them into the furnace of fire, there shall be... Where, uh, sorry, verse 49. So shall it be at the end of the world. When you get to 24, come over to Matthew chapter 24. And I think we sometimes don't live with the idea that this is not where it's at. We are not perpetual Americans living in this little perpetual bliss of what we assume is life. We're just passing through, as the old song says. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. Look at Matthew 24. Look down in verse number 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Verse 6. You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Verse 13. But he that shall endure unto the end shall be saved. Verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So the road has a beginning and it has an end. Now what about some of the signs along the way? And I've told you this before, so I hope you understand what I'm talking about. There's some for sure signs. I gave them to you out of Paul's epistles because Paul is our apostle. He's the apostle to the Gentiles. He's the apostle for the body of Christ. So if I'm going to learn the Bible for me in the church age, I'm going to learn from Paul's epistles. So I gave you those two passages. Those are for sure signs. We see those, we can understand that. However, when you read Revelation 1, 2, and 3, and also Matthew 24, you can see that there's some type of time gap after the rapture. And let me clarify this. The next great event on the calendar, prophetically, is the rapture of the body of Christ, of all believers. The Lord's going to come in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. The last trump, the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. That's the rapture. So that's what we're looking for and we're waiting for. However, when you read Revelation 1, 2, and 3, you have a message that's given to churches that will be in the Great Tribulation period, which is after the rapture of the church. And that message in Revelation 1, 2, and 3 is given to those churches, and they're anticipating the future Great Tribulation. That tells me there is some type of a gap that takes place, and different people have different speculations and opinions, won't get into all that. There is a gap after the rapture of the church before the actual beginning of the last half of Daniel's 70th week, which you read about in Daniel chapter number 9. That's called the Great Tribulation or the time of Jacob's trouble. So there's some type of a gap. In other words, there's a message given to those in preparation for that time for them to overcome, for them to endure to the end, for them to hold on and to endure. All those messages given to those churches that will be in the tribulation, period. Not people that are saved like we are here in the body of Christ. Not us. When I say churches, I'm speaking of churches in the great tribulation. So what does that tell me? That tells me there are things that have to be put in place prior to the Great Tribulation happening. So here we are, we're going down this road. We're a long way from Calvary. We're a long way from the first century, second century. We're a long way from the Dark Ages. We're a long way. I've got some Bible. We have a museum in here that Christy and I donated a few pages for. You say, what is a museum? Yeah, those are actual real Bible pages. Some of them 600 years old. You can go look at it. Now, don't go breaking in here and stealing them and going to the pawn shop. But you got these old Bible pages in here, and we're a long way. I mean, you hold this page of the Bible, and the thing's 400 years it's older than anything I have. Now, you can go outside and look at a rock, and of course, it's older than that. But that's pretty neat to have something out of We're a long way from the Reformation. 
So if the Great Tribulation is still out in the future, if the Antichrist kingdom is still out in the future, then I believe we will see some signs along the way. I've given you the illustration a gazillion times. You're driving on the road and you're going to um, Atlanta, Georgia. And you're going to Atlanta, Georgia, you're on I-75, and you see all these signs for Rock City and Chattanooga, Tennessee. You're not going to Chattanooga, Tennessee. But you're seeing some signs for something that's beyond your destination. We will see, I think it's pretty reasonable to believe, some things get into place that are in preparation for the Antichrist, that are in preparation for the Great Tribulation period, that will take place after we're gone. So, chill out. It's okay. You are not going through the Great Tribulation period. You are not going to lose your salvation. That's not going to happen to you. Now, some changes take place because of major events in society. Just like we're seeing right now. Wherever it came from, we're not getting into that. But you have major events, wars, pestilences, attacks, terrorism, different things, and it actually changes instantly societies and cultures. We know that. But there are some changes that take place and can only take place through time. Because what has to happen is thoughts have to be introduced. Because people have to be changed by way of education. And so, therefore, I mean, good night. Some of you older folks in here, you never would have believed that people would think marriage could be between anything other than a man and a woman. That just never even went between your brain. I never even knew what a sodomite was until maybe around middle school when we might have made fun of somebody that was, you know, sissified. I mean, I never even, never even thought about that, never even knew that kind of stuff was there because it wasn't introduced. Certain things have to be introduced and educated to put the thoughts in your mind to bring out the sin nature that is already there to activate that stuff. Nobody's going to get drunk if they don't have anything to get drunk off of. You have to have the thing to be able to activate it. Therefore, so you begin to see the education process and things have to take place through time to get people to think a certain way. So change can come about. It can't just... And then there's the other issue. Certain things can only take place when you have the technology available to make it take place. I mentioned Hitler before and how he manipulated what he did without a computer, <laughs> without smartphones. And you got all these people marching into these cars and they have these marks on them and they're going in there and doing all this. But certain things that you read about in the book of Revelation, where Revelation chapter 13, the entire world is able to unify together, there has to be things in place to make that possible. And that takes place in time, and it th takes place through revelation. So I believe there are some things take, taking place now. I mean, really, I remember as a kid, through science fiction movies and stuff, you would envision some things like, you know, we didn't think it'd ever be possible to see somebody across the world and be able to talk back and forth to them. Now, some, some of the older folks, my grandmother, she grew up, you know, on a farm, and maybe they went to this, I mean, a working farm. They, they lived off the farm. And her sister wrote a book about it, and it's neat to sit there and read about her. My grandmother was the oldest, and she took care of a lot of the younger ones. But they went to the city, you know, maybe once a month, and they might get a few things in the city. But pretty much they lived off the farm up until she was about 19, 20 years old. And I guarantee you, she never even envisioned certain things in her day. I mean, people will think it would be strange. You mean you can talk with your voice to somebody all the way around the world? No, you can sit there and look at them across the world face to face. You can envision that as a kid, some of us, by way of science fiction movies, but that technology doesn't exist. Well, it does now. And probably a whole lot more exists than you realize. There are things flying through the air right now that you don't even realize. So, these things have to be in place, and I believe we're seeing these things. Now, I'll give you some biblical signs here from Romans chapter 11 if you'll turn over. Romans chapter number 11. 
One of the signs along the way is definitely the establishment of the nation of Israel. Romans chapter number 11. Because when you read Bible prophecy, Bible prophecy is all centered around the nation of Israel. Romans chapter number 11, Paul says this. Verse number 1, Romans 11, verse number 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. Watch you not what, what saith the scripture of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself seven thousand men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so, at this present time, there remaineth a remnant according to the election of grace. Notice that verses 1 and 2, the physical nation of Israel is in existence when Paul wrote. Now keep reading in the Bible here, in chapter number 11, we'll have time to go through all of it. But when you read through 16, 17, 18, 19, he's comparing the Gentile nations with the fact that they rely on the nation of Israel because really, as Christians, everything we have is Jewish. Jesus Christ was a Jew. The Bible's written by all Jewish authors. The Bible's a Jewish book. And so when you look at the Judeo-Christian worldview, there's no doubt that they're connected because of God from the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. It's one God. And so we have everything as Gentiles because of the Jews, but the problem is the Jews corporately as a nation rejected Christ. They rejected the gospel as you read in the book of Acts. What does Paul say to us Gentiles? Verse 25, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Zion a deliverer. The nation of Israel will be preserved, and he says all Israel will be saved. Now up until about 1917, with the different acts that they enacted, the Balfour Declaration and so forth, in 1918, the return of Israel to their promised land. And finally in 1948, you have an actual state in Israel after all those years since 70 A.D. And you have the nation established in the land. You say, well, we have all these Jews over here. There are more Jews in Israel now than even in the United States. That's very interesting because when you read Bible prophecy, everything centers around that people. And when the rapture of the church takes place, God is done dealing with the Gentiles and His attention turns back to the Jew because the great tribulation, I gave it to you earlier, is also called, Jeremiah 30 verse 6, the time of Jacob's trouble. The whole purpose of global unity, the whole purpose of a cashless system, the whole purpose of the Antichrist ruling over the world has to do with the nation of Israel. God will use the great tribulation to get the nation of Israel to bend the knee and receive the Messiah. Fine. What will take place that you read about in Revelation chapter number 6, you read about the martyrdom that will take place of the Jewish believers because they will turn to their Messiah and they will be betrayed and killed. So the Jewish nation has to be established. Another thing, turn over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We know that the Jewish temple has to be restored. Now we know this because Revelation chapter 11 tells us in the future tribulation there is a Jewish temple. And we know this from also Paul's epistles here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. However, in 70 AD the temple was destroyed. Now they say the Mosque of Omar, the Arab temple, sits on the holy site. At least a part of that area. So people say, well how in the world can all these prophecies in the Old Testament and prophecies even in the New Testament be fulfilled when there's no Jewish temple? I don't know, but I know that there is going to be a Jewish temple. Will we see that in our lifetime? I don't know. I guarantee you in 1948 there was a lot of Christians that never thought they would see the establishment of the nation of Israel in their lifetime. They might have been like us. They might have thought, well, that's one of those signs we know has to have fulfillment because the book of Revelation mentions uh, the place where our Lord was crucified. It's also mentioned that it is said to be Sodom. And it's interesting that Tel Aviv in Israel is the Sodom capital of the world. That's what it's known as. The sodomy capital, capital of the world. Anyway, we know from Revelation that Israel's back in the land. So people probably, and Christians like us in 1918, 20, 
Of course, C.I. Schofield did his reference Bible in 1909, and he still believed in the restoration of the nation of Israel. That's very telling. That shows you that if you study the Bible like you're supposed to, you'll believe right. The, the nation wasn't even established, and, and people like him and several other preachers back in that day, they said Israel will be back in the land one day. They knew it. They didn't know if they'd see it in their lifetime, and lo and behold, 1948, some of them did see it. Lo and behold, we didn't know we would see certain things in our lifetime. I mentioned some of the technology and we're starting to see it. Did you ever think that everybody could get a mark and be tracked all across the globe? That technology is available. It's possible. You think people could be listening to you when you didn't know it? That's possible. It's like Thessalonians chapter number 2. We may see the temple rebuilt. Look, 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, notice he mentions... The coming of the Antichrist, the son of perdition, verse number 3. And the context has to do with the second advent of Christ. And of course, before Jesus Christ comes, at his second coming to the earth, the Antichrist is going to have a revelation. So before the revelation of Jesus Christ takes place, the revelation of the Antichrist will take place. Verse number 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showed himself that he is God. So there has to be a temple. What the Antichrist is going to do is go into that temple and going to go into the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant is, and he is going to declare himself the I am that I am. When he does that, I believe that's equated with the book of Daniel, the abomination of desolation that Jesus mentions in Matthew chapter 24. And when he, and he tells the Jews, when you see that, you better run. And that's the point when they will know he is not our Redeemer, he is the Antichrist. This is the one that's been prophesied by the book of Daniel. And we better get out of here. And once he declares himself as God, he will begin to murder and he will begin to kill and execute on a much wider scale than Hitler or anyone ever did before of those Jewish believers. So the Jewish temple will be in place. You say, preacher, there's no way they could build such a magnificent temple and do all that work. I don't know. They can put stuff up pretty quick nowadays. I will tell you this, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse number 9. There's no temple there. It's actually a tabernacle. You know what the Bible calls it? The Bible calls the tabernacle the temple. It's very possible that area could be leveled. It could be, I guarantee you the Jews have the technology to level the Mosque of Omar. <laughs> Amen. They could take care of that from the Golan, High, Golan Heights any minute if they wanted to. And within a matter of hours, you could have a tabernacle erected. So what is that tabernacle called? It's called the temple. All kind of scenario. We could see that, man. That would be exciting. Not saying exciting for bombs going off and all that. I'm not advocating that. Obviously, world conflict is in view. Turn to Daniel chapter number 7. I want to give you this. I mentioned before that everything centers on the nation of Israel. What are some signs along the way? Well, the signs along the way have to do with empires. When you read the book of Daniel, it's very interesting that you have only in the book of Daniel parts of the Bible that are not written in Hebrew. From Daniel chapter 2... I forget which verse, over to another verse in Daniel chapter 7. There are so many portions of Scripture written in the Chaldean language, the Aramaic language. You say, why is that? Well, think about it. When Daniel writes, they're in Babylonian captivity. The Jews are in captivity to the Gentiles. The New Testament is written in Greek because that was the dominant language of the day. The dominant written language of the day was because of the Greek influence. So the Jews are still subservient there. They're not in control. So the book of Daniel has all of this prophecy about Gentile kingdoms. Why? Because that relates to the apple of God's eye, Israel. That's the only reason. The only reason we are anything, and I'm not... Look, I'm red, white, and blue. My grandfather fought in World War II. Christie's grandfather fought in World War II. I'm all about America. Believe me, don't, don't misunderstand me. But we are not here because we're some great republic and we're some great democracy. I believe we are here in relationship to the nation of Israel. I don't even think we're here in relationship to getting the gospel across the world. Although America has fulfilled the Great Commission like no other nation before. 
Amen. Your most successful mission work has come out of the United States of America. However, without the nation of the United States of America, I doubt you would have ever had the establishment of Israel in 1948. And I doubt they would still be alive right now because we are their biggest and best ally. Having said that, when you read the book of Daniel, you say, Preacher, show me America. Okay, here we go. Daniel chapter 7, verse 1. In the first year of Bel Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream. Here we go, verse 3. Four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. There we go, Preacher! America! Stars and stripes, I see it. Ah... Uh, I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon his feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it, and they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, the beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and beheld a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured, and there's tanks. <laughs> I'm just being funny. Great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. I considered the horns and behold there came up among them another little horn. Before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit. We know who that is whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like the pure wool and his throne like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were open. So there's Jesus Christ. There's the second advent. Verses 9 and 10. So let's keep reading in the passage as the angel gives the interpretation here. Verses 15, 16, 17. Look in verse 17. Verse 16, he told me and made me know the interpretation. Here it is, preacher, it's going to be United States. Verse 17, these great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. First and foremost, they represent kings. Then secondly, they represent the kingdoms. Okay? So if we back up, you say, well, preacher, Daniel chapter number 2 and Daniel chapter 7 goes... goes they coincide together. And if you have a reference Bible, a lot of times they'll give you the cross reference back to Daniel chapter 2. And you go through those beasts that Nebuchadnezzar sees and they say, see, the first beast is obviously the kingdom of Babylon. That matches this. The problem is, this is in the first year of Darius. Nebuchadnezzar is already gone. These are four great beasts which shall arise out of the earth. So my contention is this, you can't go back to Daniel chapter number 2 and start with the kingdoms. Any of you know world history, this makes it a whole lot easier. You start with the major world kings and kingdoms, and you start and go from Babylon. But when you get to Daniel chapter 7, he tells him these are four great beasts which shall arise. So you have to move to the next kingdom. What does that have us do? Verse number 4, the one that's like a line has to be the kingdom of Persia. That's the next great world empire. Then when you get down to verse number 5, you have to move to Greece. Alexander the Great. It breaks up into four divisions. Just like you read in Daniel chapter 8. Uh, verse number 6. That has to be Rome. And Rome splits into the four kingdoms. So when you begin to look at this thing, you have to make sure your starting point is right. You say, where's the United States? Well, do you remember when you studied prophecy about the church age? How everything's going along there in the book of Acts. The Jews reject the gospel. So now we have this parenthesis stuck in here, the church. That's where we are. We're this parenthesis. All of that prophecy in the Old Testament relates to the Jews and the Gentile kingdoms as they relate to the Jews. Then you have this church age that's stuck in here like a bubble. And here we are, and all of that prophecy that's been ticking along all the way up until that time has been put on hold. The battery ran out. The battery's been pulled out and the clock is still sitting there. When the rapture of the church takes place, 
the clock starts ticking again. So then you pick back up with the Roman Empire. So you have a revived Roman Empire, and that's interesting because when you read in the book of Revelation, he talks about Babylon mystery the great, the mother of harlots. And the reason he says that, when he says about this great city that rules over the kings of the earth, who John understood to be Rome at the time that he wrote the book of Revelation, it's called Mystery Babylon because if you go to Rome today, when you study the Roman religion, what you will find are the same mysterious pagan Babylonian religious practices that took place all the way back in Genesis chapter 10 in, with Nimrod. When you study anything about history, the Babylonian worship of the sun god, where they had this round thing, and they have all these little dots, and they'd hold it up like this at 12 o'clock on Sunday. And they'd have a woman and her baby, and they would worship them. All of those things are in place in Rome today. Therefore, where's the United States? We're not here. You say, what's a sign along the way? I don't know, but I don't read about a superpower over here in the West. Not in Bible prophecy. Well, don't you know Revelation 17 is really the United States of America? Okay, like I said, everybody's got two armpits. Very interpretive and very speculative. When you read the Bible, you don't find... You say, well, they just hadn't discovered it yet. You know, Columbus ain't in the Bible, so they just hadn't discovered the Indians and everything over here, so God just doesn't reveal. Okay, whatever you want to believe. I'm just telling you, be prepared. One of the signs that we might see, here's my speculation, is the complete demise of a superpower over here. You may tell it to you like I'm going to tell you, we may very well see America completely crumble as a world power before the rapture. Say, so do you wish that? No, man. I like having prosperity. I like having money. I like having it easy. I'm just telling you like it is. I like padded pews. I like freedoms. I like liberty. I like having a bigger gun than the other nations. I like all that stuff. But I'm just telling you biblically as a Christian, how do we respond as we're going along this road? we got to realize we're on the road a long way from Calvary. And as we're going along this road, we're seeing some signs that the clock is about to start ticking again for the nation of Israel. That means the time of the Gentiles is going to be done. That means there's probably more Christians in America than any other nation. And it may very well be the rapture takes place, and of course the country would collapse then, but it very well may be that the country collapses before then. America has already crumbled, crumbled uh, morally. Man, it's been crumbled morally for years and years and years. And, you know, you say, well, we have the prosperity. What does that mean? That may be more a curse than a blessing. Luke chapter 17. I've got to give you these and we're going to wrap it up. Luke chapter 17. And by the way, if you want your Mother's Day message, it's the one that was loaded up this morning. So, <laughs> I did preach a Mother's Day message. A nice, encouraging message. Well, uh, it's, it's for all of us. Amen. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. America's going to fall, huh? <laughs> it's like, hey, great. Luke chapter 17. Look, I love, man, I get, I tell you what, you want to you wanna get some patriotic blood going through your veins? Listen to a Marine uh, marching band play the Star Spangled Banner. Man, boy, that don't sound good. I mean, I, I'm an American. Don't get me wrong. But I'm telling you, our, this world is not our home. And, you, and, and some Christians, man, they're, they're trying to fight for what we might have had 30, 40, 50, 60, 80 years ago. They're trying to hold on to it. You're not going to hold on to it. It's, and, and the Lord's got this thing already mapped. Out. You're not going to change. The Bible's already told you how the thing's going to wind up. And we're way down the road. Luke 17, this is pretty applicable. I think you understand this. Luke 17, verse number 25. But he must suffer many things and be rejected this, this generation. Verse 26, and as it was in the days of Noah, or Noe, 
That's the New Testament way of saying the Old Testament Noah. So shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage. Until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot. They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In Daniel chapter 11 verse 37, when it describes the Antichrist, it says he will not have, he will not have a desire of women. I believe that's in relationship to sodomy. Possible. What well, we see in that sign, I think that billboard's been up for a long time. It's globally accepted. And it's actually to the point to where it will be a hate crime to preach the Bible as it relates to moral issues along those lines. What about government-controlled societies? Revelation chapter number 13, if you want to turn there real quick. Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13 reveals to us details about the Antichrist. He's called the beast. There are two beasts in the passage. The second beast is the false prophet. The first beast is the Antichrist. And that we term often call the Antichrist. But you'll notice in Revelation chapter number 13... Notice in verse number 3. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Look at that thing, all the world. Look in verse 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not in the book of life. Look in verse 16. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, threescore, and six. I mentioned before Hitler had the ability before computers to monitor people and to put marks upon people and to control people. And now we have the technology in place to literally mark and track people. Notice something that only the King James Bible has. Notice in verse number um, what was the verse that we just read? 16. Notice the wording. He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark. Look at this. In their right hand, or in their foreheads. All the other Bibles say on. That's interesting to me. So, well, that's just, you know, you can translate the Greek word. and I, Look, I know all that. <laughs> but I think that's very interesting. And so when you begin to think about this, you have in Revelation 13, we'll have time to get into it, but we saw it back in Daniel, there's these ten horns that pop up. In Daniel chapter 2, that last empire has ten toes, and those ten toes are actually satanic plus human mixture there, Daniel chapter number 2. But here in Revelation 13, there are ten horns that are said to be ten kings that have their designation from the Antichrist, and they give their power to the beast, and they rule over the entire world. Global unity, and not just economically, but as far as food sources are concerned, as far as health care is concerned, as far as religion is concerned. Because everything is connected to worshiping the beast. You'll notice in verse number 18 the connection. And you don't want to lose this. It says, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. Number of, look at this, a man. 
So, preacher, we're seeing all this stuff on the scene, and they got all this technology now. They're saying they're going to make people get vaccinated. And over in Israel, all the kids are going to have chips put in them now because they all got to have keep up, make sure they're vaccinated. If you come in, you don't have the chip. We can't scan you. We can't know that you're vaccinated. So you're let out. You can't go to the grocery store and get in line because you're not back. However that thing's going to play out, they have the technology. They have that stuff in place. That stuff's kind of spooky. It's weirding me out. However, the man's not here. Or he's not revealed yet. So how do you know that? Once the man is revealed, there's a connection between the mark and the man. And once there's a connection between the mark and the man, there's the religious element involved. Because remember, there's something at force at play here, and that's the spirit of the devil. The devil has always solicited worship. Remember Nebuchadnezzar? When he had all the people together and he had the image, and you bow down to get the image, Revelation 17, 13 has got the image there. They bow down to the image to worship him. Jesus Christ, when he's tempted by the devil, the devil shows him an image of all the kingdoms, and he said, bow down and worship me and all will be yours. He desires worship. There has to be the man connected to the mark. Now, I'm not telling you to go out and get a chip in your arm, because I ain't about to do that. But I'm telling you, the man's not here. If the man's here, the mark's here. You say, preacher, how do you know we're not going to be in the tribulation? How do you know all this stuff in Revelation is not us? I'm glad you asked to go into extra innings. <laughs> because let me tell you this, we're going down the road, but we're not just walking down the road. We're in a vehicle. Right? Call it a bus. Church bus. We're on the church bus. <laughs> We're riding along in the church bus, and that means we're going down the road, but we're in the vehicle. We're protected from the elements. Remember the verse I told you to remember out of all the other verses? 1 Corinthians 15, he says, As in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. We're in Christ. If you're saved, you're in Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter number 5 that we're a bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh. Romans chapter 8, nothing shall separate us from the love of Christ. I hope some of you have been following the lessons we've been giving on salvation. We gave the lesson last on eternal security and assurance of salvation. I hope you know that you know that you know that you're saved. If you have trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you're saved and you're safe. You can't go to hell. So preacher, I'm all worried. I'm all... Okay, I I'm getting worried because, you know, you can't get Chick-fil-A anymore. I understand that. I am having major Chick-fil-A withdrawals. I did get it one time right when things started getting quarantined. I went through the drive-thru and, uh, and, you know, I was kind of a little weird wondering if they were sneezing on my food, but I ate it. Um, but it's been a long time, man. I have not had my Chick-fil-A. I understand getting weirded out about losing some of your securities and thinking, oh no, I'm not going to be able to go to the pharmacy. Oh no, I might not get my medicine. Oh no, my health is going to be affected. Oh no. I understand some of those securities realizing, oh, they may come take my house. They might shut the church. I understand some of those insecurities, but don't let that bleed over into your personal spiritual life to where you think that God's against you or you think you're going to lose your salvation or you might go to hell or the Antichrist is going to chase you down and chop your head off. You are saved and you are safe in Christ. We're going down this road and we're in this vehicle. We're on the church Bible bus and we are in Jesus Christ. You cannot go into the great tribulation. We've been preaching this for years. And I know some people have gotten off this bandwagon because they got into false doctrine. I know some of the preachers uh, have gotten off of this because they didn't understand things. And they got into this stuff to where they taught, well, you know, we might be raptured after the tribulation. And we might get raptured before the wrath is unveiled. And all this kind of stuff. But I still believe the Bible teaches a clear pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Amen. That you're going up before the Antichrist comes down. Give you a good example. The body of Christ starts with Jesus Christ on the cross. The way is made when that spear goes in his side, correct? Now we understand some of the teachings from Acts chapter number 2 about being baptized into Christ and being baptized with the Holy Ghost. Peter put that connection back to Acts chapter number 2 when he was relaying the information about Cornelius and says, hey, we got baptized with the Holy Ghost then. I understand about, you know, the church actually, you know, understanding these things. But the way begins with Christ on the cross. 
Judas Iscariot is said to be the son of perdition. I don't understand all the details about that, but I know that Jesus Christ said, Have not you chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil. Not possessed with the devil, although he was possessed later on. He said, one of you is a devil. Judas Iscariot is said to be the son of perdition in John chapter 17. The only other time that is used is in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 17. And that is used specifically of the Antichrist. He said, he said in John 17, All that thou hast given me is mine, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture should be fulfilled. Judas Iscariot dies before Jesus Christ dies on the cross. He's out of the picture before that spear goes in his side and the way is made for the body of Jesus Christ, which is the church, to even be formed. So for us to teach, well, the Antichrist is going to show up and the mark's going to be given out, the body of Christ is gone because the great tribulation deals with the nation of Israel and there's a whole change, what we call it in Bible theology and economy, there's a whole change of plan and program. Remember in your mind, Matthew 24, we read it previously, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world until the end. That's not the gospel we preach. The gospel of the kingdom has to do with Jesus Christ ruling and reigning as King of kings and Lord of lords. It has to do with the signs, wonders, and miracles miracles that they did while he was on the earth. We preach the gospel of the grace of God, which looks back to Calvary and looks to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Two different gospels, two different times, two different groups. When you read Revelation, God makes a distinction between Jews and Gentiles. In this age, God makes no distinction. If a Jewish person came in here and they got saved and they wanted to be baptized, I'd baptize them just like I baptize every one of you. you say, why? Because they're in the body of Christ. If somebody is saved, whether they're Jew or Gentile, Galatians tells us this, that we're one in the body of Christ. But in the Great Tribulation, Revelation 7, you see the distinction. Revelation 14, you see the distinction. He calls out Jews and he makes the distinction again between Jews and Gentiles. Different age. He tells them, if you don't endure unto the end, you won't be saved. He tells them in Revelation chapter 12. He tells them in Revelation chapter 14. He tells them in Revelation 22. He says, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. That's not what you're told to do. You're told to believe on Jesus Christ for salvation. But the Jews in the Great Tribulation period will have to take heed to those commandments. And they will have to endure to the end. If anybody in the Great Tribulation takes the mark of the beast, they go to hell. I don't care how many times they pray the sinner's prayer. I don't care what kind of left behind movies you watch or whatever theology you want to subscribe to. People can lose their salvation and go to hell in the Great Tribulation period. That's the whole reason, the main reason, we preach the pre-tribulation rapture. Amen and amen. amen. I know I'm in overtime. <laughs> but I'm telling you, if you begin to mix those things together, by the way, when you read Hebrews 3, Hebrews 6, Hebrews 10, James 2, James chapter number 5, Revelation 1, 2, and 3, those passages deal with last time issues that relate to Jewish tribulation saints in the Great Tribulation. That's why they have those passages that are kind of scary. It's impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and, and been made partakers of the Holy Ghost if they fall away to renew them to repentance. How many times have you sinned since you've been saved and God didn't cast you away? You can't lose your salvation at this age, but I can take you to 20 or 30 verses in the New Testament that teach you can. So what's the, what's the problem, preachers? The Bible contradict? No, the Bible doesn't contradict. There are prophetic portions in the Bible that are aimed beyond us. We're so focused on us, we think everything's about us. The reason for the pre-tribulation teaching is to help us understand you can't lose your salvation. If you're in the great tribulation, you can lose it. So how do you lose it? Well, you really think that you want to feed your kids, so you'll bow the knee. You really want that medicine? You really want to be able to go through the grocery line? So you take the mark, and in doing so, you're giving allegiance to the Antichrist. Not you, I'm talking about somebody that's there. And if you take the mark, the Bible tells you in Revelation 14, the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. Revelation 14, 11. And finally, we're going down the road, we're in the Bible bus, we're in Christ, 
We see all these signs, but then we're headed for an exit. And the exit is the rapture. That's what we're looking for. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Titus 2, verse 13. Philippians 3, our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're looking for. I'm not looking for some weird barcode to show up on all my food. I'm getting ready to eat Chick-fil-A bun and I see this barcode across the bun. You say, what are you going to do? I'm going to peel it off and eat it. <laughs> I'm not looking for some, you know, somebody over here claims that he's the Antichrist or somebody over here. I know some of that stuff's interesting. I know we're seeing some signs. I know we're seeing some of these weird things in our culture. I am looking for that blessed hope. I'm looking for Jesus Christ to come and get me. I've got my mind focused on Him. I know things may get bad. Things may get worse. They may get worse, sir. Our exit is the rapture. Amen. So spiritually... Respond in the right way. As an American, respond in the right way. If you can vote, vote. If you can say, hey, I want my liberties and keep my freedoms, keep your freedoms. But as a Christian, guard your Christian testimony and realize people are watching you. They're going to see you be just like every one of them. Just try to look out for number one and just try to keep your food coming in and keep your money coming in and pull out your gun and try to shoot everybody just so you can eat. Or are they going to see you trying to win people to Christ? Because here's the truth of the matter. 2 Thessalonians 2, we didn't have time to read it. The Bible says, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Talking about all these people now that we see. And there's so many people. You talk about deception. Like I told you before. Some things you just don't, you're not, you don't have, we're not privy to. We don't have intel on. You talk about deception. You have people on this side of the spectrum believing all this crazy stuff, and then you have people way over here on this side of the spectrum. Where's the, the truth? I don't know. It might not even be in the middle. It might be up there or down there. I don't know where the truth is, but I'm telling you this. People are easily deceived. And he says over in 2 Thessalonians 2, for this cause, because they don't want the truth now, they don't want Jesus Christ now, for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. There is a great deception coming. People are watching us as Christians. How are we going to respond? We need to have the right answer. I'll close with this great song. And as I was studying for this, I was playing some music and this song came on and, I, and it, man, it just helped me. And I figured I would, I would, I would, I know you know the song. I care not today what tomorrow may bring. If shadow or sunshine or rain... The Lord I know ruleth o'er everything, and all of my worry is vain. The tempest may blow and the storm clouds arise, obscuring the brightness of life or light. I'm never alarmed at the overcast skies. The Master looks on at the strife. I know that He'll safely will carry me through no matter what evil's betide. Why should I then care that the tempest may blow if Jesus walks close to my side? Our Lord will return to this earth some sweet day. Our troubles will then all be o'er. The Master so gently will lead us away beyond that blessed heavenly shore. Living by faith in Jesus above. Trusting, confiding in His great love. From all harm safe in His sheltering love. I'm living by faith and I feel no alarm. Don't worry about this stuff. Yeah, you might have to worry about some essential needs. It's going to be all right. Our exit is just around the corner. We might see some signs along the way, and the thing to do is say, man, we've never been down this part of the road before. You ever take a, a trip, and you go somewhere, and you maybe you always go the same way, and say, hey, let's go the back roads. Man, we're riding on some back road. We ain't never seen this kind of stuff. I had so many people tell me, even older people say, I've never seen this stuff in my lifetime. Oh, it's kind of neat, isn't it? So you got a twisted way of looking at things. Well, so did Paul the Apostle. He says, I have a desire to depart. I'm kind of looking forward to dying. And being with Christ, which is far better. So yeah, we have a weird way of looking at death. But we also should have a weird way of looking at all this stuff. Because these are just signs along the way. It just tells us we're getting closer and closer to the exit. You hear those little voices in the back say, are we there yet? 
How much further? I gotta go to the bathroom. <laughs> Let me out. Just hold on, we're gonna go to the exit. Then you can go to the restroom in New Jerusalem. <laughs> All right, let's stand to be dismissed. I appreciate you letting me rant and rave. There's just so much material I could I couldn't split it up into two messages. I will not preach this long next week, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs>